Um, welcome everyone to tonight's presentation by Master Gardener Jane Shaw. She'll be talking about pollinators, butterflies, and native plant gardens. Um, Marea is uh, the Mid-Atlantic Renewable Energy Association. We're a nonprofit. We present uh, monthly educational programs, particularly on renewable energy, but also sustainable living and interesting related topics uh, like tonight's. Um, coming up on May 30th, Mark Fiesel, an adjunct professor at Northwestern University and a microgrid expert in the um, private sector. He will, Mark will speak on the importance and growth of microgrids in achieving zero carbon, as well as making the grid more resilient. Um, that's May 30th, Mark Fiesel, microgrids. Um, if you've missed past presentations or you're interested in what some of our past presentations are, we have uh, approximately 36 videos over, from over the past three years on the uh, Marea YouTube channel. Um, a lot of people were not aware of that, so just wanted everybody to know that. There's a lot of good information out there, and I believe tonight's presentation will also eventually end out there uh, in the next few days. So, Chuck, you're going to introduce tonight's speaker. Sure, I'm happy to introduce Jane Shaw who um, is a Penn State Perry County Master Gardener. She is a passionate observer of local butterflies and pollinators. She has been a Perry County Master Gardener since 2012. She is also a member of the Wild Ones Native Plant Organization, local South Central Pennsylvania Wild Ones chapter in the greater Harrisburg area. One previous garden tour to her property, Jane named her gardens Butterfly Haven. Prior to her retirement, she was an educator for the Capital Area Intermediate Unit in the Harrisburg, Pennsylvania area. She's taught three to five year old children with special needs for 25 years, and then English language learners for kindergarten through high school for her final six years of teaching. Uh, Jane, that brings passion to me because I have an adult um, Down syndrome daughter who lives at home with us and um, is, a, is a true delight to be yes. part of our family. <laughs> yeah. um, Jane, without further ado, I'll let you share your screen and we can go on with your presentation. And again, thank you so much for accepting our invitation tonight. Thank you very much. Now, for a second, I just want to um, show some, can they see me in big? I'm not sure how this works, but um, this is a handout I have that will eventually get to you. But as we go, I'll be pointing out, you can have your, uh, cam your phone cameras available and take some slides because this packet will give you like a butterfly guide. You can print it, take it with you on hikes and, and you'll be able to say, oh, this is the, the one I see and then make some notes about it. And then there'll be a couple other handouts that um, uh, Chuck said he'll be able to put on the, the website later. So, all right. So I guess I need to go ahead and share my screen. Let's see here. All right. Easy. There we go. Uh, let's see. I gotta get to my. It's always a little bar at the top that makes it tricky to get to the. Ah, this little black thing, it makes it tricky to get to the slideshow. Uh, in a minute. Any advice on getting that black band out of my way here? Can't. Um, oh, there we go. I got, I got you. Sorry. There we go. All right. And then I'm going to minimize all these faces on the side so I'm not too distracted. And um, yes, um, he, um, Chuck mentioned the Master Gardener and also uh, the Wild Ones. They're both great organizations that you might want to consider if you have the passion for gardening as I do. All right. Um, Let's see. Uh, okay, so this is, uh, I decided to call it Plant It and They Will Come. And most of the photographs are I've taken myself because I just observe and snap and observe and snap and other photos are noted if someone else gave them to me. So it's created by myself. And here's a few shots of things we'll be talking about. 
And it's kind of a takeoff on the movie Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come. And I'm fortunate because we have a farmer that every other year he plants corn. So when I've had tours, I always tell people there may be some baseball players coming out of the, the, the corn as well as my butterflies. So it's kind of a fun little uh, story. And so my my garden stories is what I call it. First, I want to talk about the life cycle of the monarch, and then uh, we'll talk about all kind of host plants that attract a variety of butterflies, and you can do this too. I've been playing with it for about 12 years, and then you'll see a lot of nectar plants, and these nectar plants are attracting butterflies and everybody else in town. <laughs> so you will see that. So let's roll. Um, Host plant, when I talk about host plant and nectar plants, host plants, uh, butterflies have, or uh, to attract them, we have uh, have to have certain host plants for, for each one. I'm hearing some noise from somebody's um, screen. Uh, oh. Okay, I don't know what that is, you guys. <laughs> um, Can so everybody please mute mute themselves so that we have a clear audio for Jane. Thank you. There we go. Uh, so for example, monarchs, we all know that they need the milkweed. So host plants are where the female lays the eggs. And then when those eggs uh, hatch, the caterpillars emerge and they've got to eat that host plant. They, they, each species of butterfly has their own preference or menu of host plants that they prefer and actually require. And they use their tongue and their antenna and their feet to taste and identify to find their host plant. So that's why sometimes you see them flitting, flitting, flitting. They'll actually starve if they can't find their host plant. So if your garden doesn't have what they need, they're leaving to see if they can find it. So therefore, I, I decided plant it and they will come. So we need to grow what they need and like. And so over the last 11, 12 years, I've been doing this slowly. And you can too, but it takes time and you never know what's going to come. All right, so, and then nectar plants. We need the, the host plants, bring our butterflies. And then the, afterwards, the butterflies, we need nectar for them. And we have to have nectar all, see, you know, the spring and the summer and the fall. And so that their, their whole time that they're with us, they're finding what they need. So we have a lot of variety, I'll show you. All right, stories of my monarchs. So these are the slides. So if you wanna take a picture of this while I'm chatting, then you're going to have a collection of butterflies, uh, slides with the, the information. And you can see I'm talking about the host plants and all these different kind of milkweeds. And there's some resources you can Google. Uh, Google. And then of nectar plants, it's just an endless. But the key with um, monarchs is they migrate south for the winter. And we know that. But not all butterflies do that. So you will find out as we go along. So hopefully you got a picture of that. And later, like Chuck, we'll have that handout to try to put on the website. All right. So when I first became a master gardener, someone says, you have to plant milkweed. And I'm like, what? You, you want me to plant common milkweed in my gardens? Because I know, I always have known that it's, it, run, it, it just grows everywhere and it spreads underground and pops up all kinds of shoots. And then also all the fuzzy, the, um, the pods break open and it goes everywhere. So I have lots of this growing out on my property, but it's mostly around the edges of my country property. My, my I live in Perry County is is north uh, like northwest of Harrisburg. And so I don't really recommend that you plant this right in your favorite front yard garden because once it is, it it'll pop up, pop, pop, up. But if you have a space where you can have the common milkweed going other places, great. But what they were telling me is uh, there's there's it in bloom and it's a lovely fragrance and very good for our monarchs. But what they were telling me is, and I didn't know this, that there are wonderful perennial milkweeds. Butterfly weed, Asclepius tuberosa milkweed is a great perennial. It grows about, oh, let's see, about two and a half feet, uh, feet high. It's a nice little, more of a woody kind of shrub as a or, uh, plant as opposed to milky. And it, it's a beautiful plant. And of course, if the monarchs come, it gets all eaten, but then it will come back and it'll come back and it, it shoots off. Uh, it has pods on it to get the seeds. Um, so it, uh, it's beautiful. So now butterfly weed is not to be confused with um, 
butterfly bush. And I think you had some, a presentation about invasives. Yes, that's a problem. Butterfly bush is a problem. And basically it's candy to our butterflies. There's no nutritional value. No butterflies use it as a host plant and lay their eggs. So no caterpillars are eating those leaves. So I always tell people if they need to have, have these, their job is in the late season when it starts to get all kinds of seeds, turn to seed, they need to go out, cut every one of them off, destroy them. So that's my, my stand on. And then I, the one hand that you're gonna get is a neat little pa uh, paper that I got from the Manada Conservancy about substitutes. And, and they have substitutes for things you can plant instead of butterfly um, but butterfly bush. So that's my little speech on that. Uh, all right. So here's some of our um, um, uh, Asclepias tuberosa, the butterfly weed. And there's, I've got this one down here as an Eastern black swallowtail. And I believe this one may be a spice bush. We'll learn more about each of them in a little while. All right. Okay. Let's move on. Whoops. All right, something, my screen's not moving. What happened here? Uh, oh, there we go. Another uh, butterfly weed also comes in yellow. So it's beautiful, it's beautiful. So there's the orange and the yellow, beautiful plants. And then swamp milkweed is another one that's a perennial. Now they grow a little bit taller and a little more bushy. And this one is called, the pink is called the Sclepius incarnata. Beautiful. These these you gotta have on your list to purchase and plant. And then also the swamp milkweed comes in the ice plant, the white, and that's beautiful too. And then this past year, my I, I've got a new um, uh, milkweed, and it's called the world milkweed. And I was happy that it it looks so different. It's just all these little feathers, but it, it got eaten and. Uh, this was the flower, but it didn't it didn't mature enough for me to get any seed pods yet. So I'm, I saw it starting very tiny in the ground today. So I was excited. Uh, so here's some monarchs mating. And then I believe this is happening here. So we, we won't watch too long, but they're they're doing their they're got to do their nature. <laughs> And then um, uh, getting some, uh, possibly some nectar and possibly laying the eggs. Um, so I'm, I can watch it on my screen. Uh, here's somebody. <laughs> All right. Um, and I'm believing that um, the picture I have here, I'm believing this is a female. So I'm thinking it could be a good chance of, of laying eggs. So a friend of mine had this wonderful little microscope and now I have one, I'm not as good at using it as him, but he, this is what he shared with me. Steve Castle, another master gardener. This is my, the, the eggs two days before hatching and then one day before hatching and just before it hatched. And then this is just, the, here's the empty shell and there's the hatched larva. So I think this is like awesome stuff to be able to do. So you can see observing is fun. <laughs> and then of course the, the monarchs are starting to grow and they, whoop, I'm sorry. And so they have uh, all these stripes and they, they look very similar to the Eastern black swallowtail but the striping is different and the monarch has antenna on the front and on the back. So they have uh, you know two sets of antenna to feel and uh, touch and smell and 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 get the a sense of their environment. And uh, here's a couple, I always thought they're kind of cute playing peekaboo here and devouring the plant. And this, this plant is pretty much uh, going to be gone. And then there's some of the seeds opening on that one. And then what I do is I gather the seeds and some, you know, pretty much I gather them. So I'm in control of where um, they will be, be growing again. And what I do is I take them and use milk jugs and I drill holes in the bottom, cut, cut it open on three sides. And then I put soil and water, put the seeds in a little more soil, make sure it's nice and wet. Then I tape it with duct tape and I dig like a little hole in my raised bed and heal them in 
and I leave it, no lid on it, just let nature take its course because over the winter, they need to uh, be, go through that cold uh, process of stratification so that the seeds will germinate. So that is a real uh, fun technique. And I this year I did, I had 40 jugs of all different kinds of plants and uh, seeds and some, some will germinate and others, eh. <laughs> So these were a bunch of that I just went out the other day and found that have germinated. And then you have to play with them. They're so tiny and pot them and care for them. So I share lots of plants. Okay. So then after the milk, the monarchs have eaten and eaten and eaten and full grown, they decide they take, they generally leave the, the milkweed. I've never, one time a friend gave me a picture of one that the chrysalis was on the milkweed. They take off and they go to all kinds of places to be safe and uh, form the chrysalis. And so I, I'm showing you a few of my collection. So off they go. And here with one of my birch trees, it goes in the J formation and then the chrysalis. So that was kind of neat to find the before and after. And then these were inside my garage. This was under a shelf. This is on a window frame. Uh, they just, they are very clever. This, I thought maybe they were having a meeting and they all, uh, that was unusual, like five of them. Two have already emerged. Friends shared that. And um, this is on my uh, outdoor water spigot. It's down here. And here's a close up. And it actually, nothing, it, it did fine. And eventually, it emerged and was totally healthy. Uh, this was the funny part this year. I went to pick a tomato and I found some what <laughs> hanging underneath it. So what I had to do is I, my husband held it. I taught, got a piece of thread and I tied it around that little black stem that, that where they attach. And you can see all this silky stuff. So I had to peel, peel, peel carefully because I didn't want to disturb this. And as I peeled and peeled, it came off the tomato. And then you could see, here it is with all that silky stuff just kind of hanging out, no problem. And then I just hung it um, in, on a plant sign in a, in a pot uh, and put it in my cage, uh, uh, my, one of my butterfly cages so I could watch it. And that's what it kind of looked like hanging out. And then eventually it emerged with no problem. So sometimes I have, you have to rescue them. And this is a, a, a neat sample that I had brought three caterpillars into my cage. Here is the three stages of here it's going into the J. This one had already start, lost its, its lat, final skin and was, you know, still kind of like wet, so to speak. And here it, 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 it formed and hardened. So I like that sequence. And then this one shows that it's you know doing that last couple wriggles and wiggles and then it when it's done with its process it just hardens gives you some action all right so um here's one of my very first ones i found outside on my nine bark nine bark is a great native um uh, sh um shrub that's uh, that's beautiful and beneficial. Um, and then as they start get closer to uh, emerging, you can start to see that, that, that these colors are starting. And then it really gets vivid. And just before they emerge, you can just see the entire butterfly. It's just, just truly amazing. And, um, yep, and there's one had emerged and that was dry. It takes them a while to dry. And this one was back on that nine bark and it had emerged. And there's the, the, the empty chrysalis. And they, it, this, it took a long time. I kept coming back and taking pictures, a thousand pictures and drawing and drawing and drawing. And then finally opened its wings. And this is a male because it has these two spots. And those are the, um, the black spots for the male scent glands that produce pheromones for mating. So that's our young man. And then this is a female because there's no black spots. So it's neat to be able to fight. They, they're challenging because they're, they're busy and active. Uh, and then that th this was one of my first uh, babies. 
And I have this wonderful plant. I love it. It's called Tithonia, and it's a, it's a Mexican sunflower, and it's a, it's an annual plant. But it's it's every, all kind of pollinators just love it, they, and it's got this neat little landing pad for them. And uh, so I, I plant a lot of those, and I save the seeds and share the seeds. It's very easy to grow, and it's just a fun plant. You'll see more pictures of it. And you can get the seed packs like, you know, at, at the like I got some at Lowe's the other day, but I, I have thousands of them. If you were close, I'd be giving them to you. Uh, one time someone asked me, where do, my, where do the butterflies go at night? And I thought, hmm, that's a good question. And I observed one night and it just it was in this up in my one tree, just kind of hanging out. And I kept going back and it did stay there, you know, a good long time. So I figured they just find a place where it's comfortable and and they feel safe and hang out. So with four to seven days after they emerge from the chrysalis, a monarch uh, butterfly is old enough to mate and now the cycle begins again. So I've done some tagging and it was kind of fun in 2019. And I set up all kinds of my cages as my little nursery and I bring in the caterpillars that I find because this is kind of like August time. So I bring in a lot of the, the caterpillars that I find and uh, let them do, go through the process. And as they emerge, uh, there's one, and that's once again, a boy. And uh, these are the little tags, very sticky. You have to have a little, my husband made me a little tool and you have a chart you need to keep the data of the, the, the number of the tag and the date and if it's a male or female and if you reared it or if you captured it, you know, with a net. And mine were rearing because I got, found the caterpillars and brought them in. So then you, keep, you, you put this data into um, uh, Monarch Watch. And so there's the tag. And they tell you all how to hold them. And this is the, the little scale that you, you, they want you to put it on. They, apparently that's a safe place. It must be balanced. It doesn't bother them when they're, they're flying. So they show you how to hold them carefully and not hurt them. And there. And then, of course, I gave them some a lot of nectar. Here was the the tithonia. He's, these were some some um, zinnias because this was you know August and things were blooming. And give them some good nourish, nourishment, and then I let them go. And uh, here's the Monarch Way Station, Monarch uh, MonarchWatch dot org. There's lots of good information, and this is. It's a simple application. They want to know what if you have certain a certain kinds of plants and you list them, and then you um, become a, a, a way station and you can get this sign if you want. And I thought this was really exciting because look, my monarch can read. It was coming up the sign, and I was hoping that it would do the chrysalis there, but it didn't. I kept going out, but I thought you can read. <laughs> and this is. Uh, fascinating because in the fall this is how i'm going to explain this pretend that this is me this is fall it's time to go that last generation of monarchs that emerged they're not going to reproduce they're just going to their, their, their mission is go to mexico then they'll reproduce in a few months when they head back so this is me and this is you and your friends okay and we're all heading in like August, September, we're heading to, to Mexico. So then we're hanging out down here, all in that big tree. And then come spring, we start to go back. And then we have our children. And we, we, we are, so we have reproduced, we have our children. So then on goes, you know, our children and then another generation. And while they're up here, we're, there's a lot of generations going. Like if, if you'll start to see these, you know, in, in May maybe, and then they'll be around for a couple of weeks and then they'll have the caterpillars. And they, there's a two or three generations that happen up here in the summer. So actually the way they explained it, it would actually be my children's great, great grandchildren that return south the following spring. So last spring it was me, and now it's going to be my children's great, great, great grandchildren. So if you can wrap your brain around that, <laughs> it's almost a tongue twister. All right. 
So if you live in Pennsylvania, which you all, most of you, I think, you're eligible to certify your pollinator-friendly garden with Penn State Master Gardeners. And you go onto this website, you can take a picture. And they have it really nice now. You can do it all online. And you can print out a sheet and it tells you, it's almost like a shopping list that of plants that you that are recommended. So you can get those plants, take it with you and start studying and, and read about them and when do they bloom and how tall are they and sun and sun and shade and all that. So if that's something we can all do. And and mine is, do I have my little sign here? And that you after it was certified, you um uh, I purchased the sign. So and that was, I think it was 2018. I came home one October uh, Sunday from a little trip. And uh, I, I at least had 100 monarchs in my, in my yard. It hasn't happened again. So you just never know. And actually, there's a praying mantis right here. It's kind of like, where's Waldo? So now let's talk about some other guys. Monarchs are my... Uh, my favorite and probably a lot of people's, but there's so many others that are so much fun and I've seen them come to my property. So we're gonna go beyond the monarch. So let's just give you a little tour. I know you can't come over, but I'm gonna just put this on and you can see a little action while I get a sip. So we've got things like bee bomb, we've got Joe Pie weed. Oh, oops. oops, did I mess? I think I messed it up. Oh, fuck in here. And um, uh, oh, where's that one? Cut leaf cone flowers, um, some more, um, let's see, some phlox, all sorts of things along that way. Okay, so that's a preview of my, my place. Whoops. All right, so first we're gonna talk about swallowtails. I've, these five swallowtails, I have had visit my property, some frequent and some only once. And here they are. So I'm gonna break them all down for you. And the swallowtail, the one feature is they all have these long, like long tail parts. And it comes from similar to the, um, the birds that are the swallows, those tails. All right, let's start. So he, Eastern Black Swallowtail. So here's one of those slides if you wanna take a picture of it. I'm showing you all the host plants. And most of these are you know, like herbs. They're dill, the, in the carrot family, dill, parsley, fennel, and uh, then the Queen Anne's Lace. And I'm so excited. I've made a kind of a discovery this year. Golden Alexander's, I'm gonna show you. It's a wonderful native perennial plant. And it blooms and, and um, in the spring. And so I'm as excited because I've been seeing these Eastern Black Swallowtails. And I thought, oh, my goodness, you don't have anything to lay your eggs on because my parsley, dill, and fennel aren't, aren't coming up yet or my rue. And, and uh, then I remembered, I've got the Golden Alexanders. So if they need to lay eggs like now, they do have a host. And, and the... the, the Nectar plants are everything. Now, I'm going to tell you, swallowtails, it's called diapause. And we'll, I'll show you some things after we do all the swallowtails. They hibernate in their chrysalises. They're here. They're here all winter. I actually have in my garage uh, some cages with about eight uh, chrysalises. Most of them are probably eastern black swallowtails, and some are spicebush. And I'm waiting for them to emerge. So I'll tell you all about that. Okay, so here's our eastern black swallowtail on some parsley and more parsley as it got bigger. And you can see the coloring is so similar to the monarch, but but they don't have those big and um, the all the antennas on both ends, and the coloring is different. And they have these little these yellow spots between their stripes. Par more parsley. This one, a friend, uh, you need to plant parsley for yourself and parsley for the, the butterflies, caterpillars. And that's on dill. And this is on fennel. And these are all great attractors of all your bees and your pollinators as well. And this is the one I was talking about, the golden alexanders. It's a native plant host. And it is a beautiful plant, blooms in the 
spring and the, 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 the green stays, the foliage is there all summer because last year I actually was excited to see, it was the first time I saw the um, Eastern Black Swallowtail eat on it and eating. So I was like, yes. So that this, like I said, I just discovered that I'm set if they want to lay eggs now because the rest isn't ready. So, and then that's rue. Rue is an herb and I had a lot of action on there last year. And this was really cool. I, uh, once again, observing, I looked and I saw this is its skin. It had shed that layer of skin because they shed, shed several layers. And when I first looked, it was like about here. And then I got my camera and it was like just laying there. I thought, yes. It was, look at this. You can actually see its little uh, legs and stuff go in there. Hold on. And that's on Queen Anne's lace. And of course, our bees love that too. And here's um, the example of what I'm talking about diapause. This Eastern Black Swallowtail is, is getting ready to go into chrysalis on the siding of my friend's house and there it stayed until spring. And that's what they do when, when they're ready to make a chrysalis, uh, they, they sort of, the, the monarch was in a J formation. These guys, this is the head and this is the tail and they make the silk straps and hang on. And then they throw themselves back and I have, there's, that is so strong. There's still that position in my garage now waiting to emerge. And this is cool. And I watch, this is like, it's the final um, transition into that chrysalis and this, this is the skin. Oh, and it drops. So that is really kind of a neat. Oops. One more time. And there's what the skin looks like with that. Well, I used my camera on that, but I, I need to learn to do the microscope a lot better. So, all right. And here is what it's first, it's kind of green, but see how that silk is just so strong. And then it turns kind of a brown, and that's how it'll stay minor brown in the garage. So, here's our female Eastern Black Swallowtail, and this is our male. And I've seen some females. And the underside is a key thing with these swallowtails. Is this Eastern Black Swallowtail, all these orange scales. I'll show you another one where it's different and it helps to identify. So here then we have our ti tiger swallowtails, beautiful yellow, they're beautiful. And they are more um, in the trees. Now, because of where I live, I have a, a woods and I know I have tulip poplars, I, know, I don't believe I have magnolia, but wild cherry and ash. So these are the kind of trees that need to be in your environment. And maybe, maybe you're near a park. You know, never know what, what you're near that you may have these trees. And if you see these, you, you know that some of these are close by. And they go to all sorts of nectar plants. I just gave you some. And we'll get back to the diapause. Take a shot if you want. All right. And once again, uh, Chuck's going to post the, all that on the, your page later. All right, so here's our tulip poplar, and it looks the leaves look like tulips. And this is the, the flower that blooms on the tulip poplar. Beautiful. And magnolias, I don't have, but I got a picture just to share. And these are wild cherries. I do have some wild cherries. And let's see. And so here's our female has the blue and our male is just all that the yellow and black. Now, zebra swallowtail, uh, the, take a shot if you'd like, the pawpaw tree, that's the only thing. I remember the song when we were kids way down yonder in the pawpaw patch picking up pawpaws. <laughs> well, that's, I have some of the, some trees, but I've only had the, tiger, the, the zebra, excuse me, zebra come one time. And it was about four years ago. And I keep waiting for it to come back and come back. So it must be finding better stuff somewhere. Um, but my, my sister-in-law had one the, last year. So we're maybe coming back. So let's see. And there's a pawpaw tree. And mine's much bigger now. And those are what the pawpaw fruit looks like. 
they're kind of like a banana mangoey custard taste. And there it is. It was kind of damaged. It was the, the leaf was torn and the tails were gone. But I was happy to, like, I'm glad I had my camera. I don't usually go anywhere without my camera in my yard. And now here's one of my favorite friends, the spice bush swallowtail. And he's got this lovely blue pastel. And the two primary host plants there are spice bush. That's a bush, so you can easily get them. And a sassafras is a tree, but you know, it depends where you live. And again, we'll talk about the, the um, diapause. Okay, so this was my spice bush. Now it's very big and I I keep finding more and more popping up. So I'm very happy to have a lot of them because it's fun to see what happens. And this is um, my sassafras tree and the, it's got lots of nice blooms now. So that's another source for our bees and anybody who's coming early. But that's the trick is, you know, you gotta have some stuff in the in the spring here. And this, the sassafras tree is so fun. It's one, maybe the only tree, I'm not positive, that has different three different leaves. This I call the paw, those three um, like fingers and toes. And this I call the thumb. And then this one down here, I call the mitten. So a tree that has three different shapes of leaves is really awesome and they smell you know, the you know, the roots, I say, you know, make sassafras, uh, I guess it was tea or something. And here's some of the leaves back on the spice bush and it's folded over. Now, hmm, whoops, I'm sorry. I wonder why it's folded. Let's see what's, uh, oh, you open it up and you've got this white silky stuff. So they, somebody has spun this to, to close the leaf. Very clever. And there inside is a very tiny caterpillar. Kind of looks like bird droppings at that point. And then it gets a little bit bigger and it looks like it's got some, these eyes, but they're not real eyes. They're false eyes. This is that awesome uh, spice bush swallowtail caterpillar. And this is all just false eyes to scare away pet predators. And it looks like that's a mouth. Nope, we'll see the stuff in a minute. Uh, and then as after they've matured and they're getting ready to go in Christmas, they start to change to this yellow. Got to change. But it looks like he's looking at you, but that's just the scare away predators. And it's yellow and getting ready to go in the chrysalis. So now I've got it in my cage and it's it's searching. It's trying to find where to go. Where should I go? So it's looking all over the place <laughs> and it looks like it, it looks like the mouth. This actually is where the mouth and the eyes are. There we go. It appears that that could be the mouth and the eyes are here. And I love this. Um, let me get that moving for you. Well, you can see the locomotion and how it's trying to figure out where am I going? What am I going to do? What, where do I want to be? And there it's going to move for us. I just love it. You can see all the suction on there, releasing and moving. And then it finally found a leaf that it chose. And the same thing, It's there's the head, there's the tail, spin this silk straps for it to hold on. And then the next thing you know, it throws, I, I always say it throws its head back and hangs on and then it turns this brown kind of color and we'll stay that way. Well, well the this one, you know, if it happens in June, then you're gonna have some some um uh, generations. But if, when it starts happening the end of August, September, you know, they're gonna they they're gonna stay until the next spring. So that's what they look like. They're so beautiful. Now I I cannot tell the difference between male and female. So this, this blue pastel is just gorgeous. Nice little uh, tails on there. And underside is a key thing. Remember before I showed you that the other, the Eastern black had all these orange little scales. This one is, the one scale is not orange, it's just blue. So if you see the two and the, the wings are up like this, you can see, ooh, now that would be the Eastern, uh, the, the spice bush. 
And that's my Tithonia, my Mexican sunflower. It's just a yummy thing. Yeah, this was a, a, my treasure of 2022. I've been waiting for a pi pipe vine swallowtail. And the, the host plant is called a pipe vine, the native plant. And one of its favorite foods, I, I, well, I have all of them, but was this white phlox. So look at the way the tail, it, it's, just, it's just beautiful. The colors and the tail and the underside, you can see a different pattern there. With this, this just a beautiful blue. And look up close. And the, a friend, I didn't see these. A friend had the caterpillars in her yard and she shared these pictures that that's the caterpillars. I'm getting a little uh, more close up and see all the prickly things on them. And these swallow, whoops, I'm sorry. Swallowtails tend to have, if they get in danger, these, these hidden uh, fork shaped glands that come out of their head and they're, they're located under the skin behind the head and the gland is extended when threatened. And it's, it's kind of a foul smelling thing to help them you know, if they're being attacked. And then this is my pipe vine plant. It's rather small. And then a local nursery had this bigger one, which might, that's where I'm hoping mine will go. And this is, shows you some action. Just love that nectar. And it was around my place for uh, two or three days. So I'm hoping and hoping that uh, that they will come back this year. Oops. Okay, now diapause. Diapause is when you're re referring to animals, is the delay in development in response to the changing in our environment. So when it gets cold, all these swallowtails, you know, towards definitely September, they're not going to, um, you know, the caterpillars emerge, but they're not going to um, change into a butterfly yet. They need to wait because the cold. And what they'll do is go into the their um, the chrysalis. And here's an example. This was an eastern black swallowtail, and this so so here here's the eastern black swallowtail, and here was this spice bush, and they were on a stick. So I just propped them in a plant, a pot of mine. And I sort of tucked it into a, a bed with some other plants and just left it outside all winter. And in the spring, um, these it, the, the plant was starting to emerge and sprout. And I brought this into my cage so I could watch to see what happened. And then through the screen, you can see that someone has emerged. And it is the eastern black um, swallowtail male. So that was really exciting. And that particular uh, spice bush did not emerge. But last year I had some others. And this year, now I've got some that are in my cages and, and awaiting. So that was our swallowtails. Now, um, painted ladies are a very popular one. Lots of schools will do um, them with the children and stuff. And some of the host plants are hollyhocks, thistle, asters, and different legumes. And here. They migrate for the winter. They're not sticking around. So here's our hollyhocks. And here's some thistle. And asters. That's one of their host plants. They'll lay the eggs there and munch, munch, munch. And then on some of our, our legumes, like green beans. I've never seen them on there. But as far as the cat, I've never actually seen the painted lady's caterpillar. I haven't had that pleasure. And that's just posing for us. And then the interesting thing about Painted Lady is under here, we have like one, two, three, four, those four primary eye spots. So then when we look at American Lady, which is their, her cousin, their host plants are different. I'll sh I, I have a couple of, I have the pussy toes, but I don't, these other ones I don't have. But they also migrate in the fall. But look, two spots. Oh, oops, I'm sorry. Oh, there's a caterpillar, excuse me. Like someone gave me that, so I was excited to get that. Here's the pussy toes. 
plant, the low growing. And here's the spots, two spots. So in the next slide, Painted Lady has one, two, three, four, and this has two. So I was lucky that one time the, the American Lady came, but I've never really seen her wings open, but they, they look about the same. And then uh, red spotted purple butterflies are beautiful. And uh, um, I have willows and these are, they're mostly these trees. And some are in my woods, some are in my yards. And they, they do some plants nectar, but they also like rotting fruit and sap and animal droppings and decay, decaying flesh of, of dead animals. So they have a different menu and um, they winter as a caterpillar. So that's, and it's probably like curling up in, I think it is curling up in the willow tree, in the trees. Yes, they, they find a place, the caterpillars, and just kind of wrap themselves in leaves and um, hang out. <laughs> so hopefully there's some in mine and they'll come. And there's like, this is a curly willow I have. And uh, just there, it's, it's a iridescent blue. It's just so pretty. And then the underside is um, very pretty too. My husband caught this uh, at a, an event last year. At the end of May, I was like, yeah. <laughs> and um, this was a surprise last year too. There was a caterpillar walking, crawling across my garage. And I thought, you're pretty big. You look like you're probably going to find a place to have the chrysalis. You're not looking for food. I had no idea what it would want to eat. So uh, in the end, this is what it was. So these are, the, once again, a bunch of trees. And once again, they like uh, tree sap, juices from rotted fruit and berries, liquids from animal droppings, you know, uh, of tree blossoms. And they overwinter as adults, as a butterfly, sometimes under loose bark and other protected areas. So I did see one the other day fly past me on my property. And so this is what it looked like when it was crawling across my garage. So I researched and I, I wasn't sure there were several different options. And so then I put it in the cage and of course it decided it needed to uh, attach to the inside of the zipper of the cage. So therefore I couldn't get really good pictures, but it, once again, it did a J, it did the J formation and all these little pricklies. And there's the chrysalis and I watched and watched and then out came my morning cloak butterfly. So I'm excited because like I said, I saw one again last week. And fritillaries, they're very uh, wonderful plant, wonderful butterflies. This is the large one, it's the great spangled. This is our variegated and this is a small little guy, the meadow. And I believe I've been seeing some of those around already. Uh, and they all like these wild violets that we have in our yards as their host plants. So they're not really weeds. I, I keep them. I keep little patches of them and, and they're, it, it, they're really important because um, what's happening is they repro re reproduce one time. They lay their eggs on the stems at the base of the violet in the summer. The caterpillars hatch, eat their eggshells, then they hibernate all winter as a caterpillar under the violets. So if we start messing around with our violets in the spring, we can be disturbing them and destroying them. So uh, we want to really be careful what we do when we clean up our gardens, because I leave mine. It's kind of a, a winter habitat for everyone. So then here's the underside of the that great spangled. And again, on the Tithonia Mexican sunflower. And then here's our variegated um, fritillary, and it has a couple extras, violets, pansies, and the passion vine. And once again, that same uh, hibernating as a caterpillar. And here is what, there's the violets and some pansies. And this is a native passion vine, beautiful flower, great plant, it's, it grows all over, it's a big vine. And I got such a surprise this year because I, I found this caterpillar on a, one of the, a, the branch of my passion vine. So I was, you know, taking care of him. And then all of a sudden, uh, or the, well, there's the underside. 
And I went to get, a, I had a, some potted ones to give to a friend and they were covered with 25 little caterpillars. So I brought the whole kit and caboodle into my cage. And of the, of the 25 um, caterpillars, I think only one did not emerge and I was able to release them. Like, I think it was like early October. So I was very excited. Oh, wait, I've got to show you this stuff. It's really cool. So there's, a, once again, a J. And it's just a different kind of coloring. And let me see. Look at that. It's just like metallic-y white. It's so beautiful. Really a beautiful, beautiful chrysalis. And I, I had no idea what I was going to be getting. And then there it is. And that was the one of the 24 that uh, emerged. So I was really happy. And then these are the meadow fritillary. They're the littlest ones. And they primarily on the violets. And the same process of under those violets, they're hiding out. Um, just, but they're, they're small. And this is on some um, um, bee balm that I have. And then common buckeye, common buckeye, um, they move south in the winter. And here I'll show you their, um, some host plants are snapdragons. And um, this is a, the plantain, the wheat. It's a hot plant for them. And I just leave some of these here and there because they, they come up in my garden. And I'm like, okay, you guys like them. And then the snapdragons are wonderful too. Um, let's see here. And there it is. Beautiful buckeye getting some nectar off of an aster because they're kind of, they come, you know, later in the in the summer. And the eastern comma. Of course, a lots of trees and these, I must have some of these trees in my woods. And they they spend their winter inactive uh, adults, spend it um, hiding in wood piles or wherever they can get shelter. And the fun thing about them is they're called the comma because when they close up their wings, see this white comma on the bottom of their, their wing. And then uh, there, there it is again in the sky is, um, eating, he's in my compost, and he, they have a cousin, and the cousin is called a question mark, and so uh, here's the comma, they, and they, they look very similar, I've never seen the question mark, but with, for the question mark under his uh, wing is, there's the comma part, and then there would be another white dot, so that would be your question mark, but the tops look very similar with this ruffle, um, and really pretty. So I'm waiting to find one of them. It's just so hard because they move. Okay, and then another prize was a few years ago, I had a viceroy. And, and that, that willow is the, the one um, primary host. And in colder regions, the caterpillars born in the fall uh, make a, like a leaf tube in their trees and hide out there. So we've got a lot of little friends really here with us and they're not all leaving. And, you know, all of our bees and stuff are everything I'm showing you uh, are going to attract your bees and all your insects and all your pollinators. And so many of them are hiding out. They're uh, burrowing into some of the stems like bee balm, those hollow stems. So we have to really be careful what we clean up in our spring because we could be, you know, damaging their habitat. And this was exciting because it was on my New England aster, great native plant. Um, here was our my viceroy, and here is the monarch. So they were hanging out together. So it was a great prize. And it's been a few years since I've seen the viceroy, so I keep looking. And then this was kind of a newer one. I don't have any of these nettle plants in my yard, but they must be somewhere <laughs> um, in my wood. Um, okay. Uh, and they kind of, it says they, the chrysalis, they sort of stay on the plant. Um, and then they migrate in the fall in large numbers south. And they're very, the underside, this is the head and the antenna and the legs and the, the underwing is very camouflaged. It's hard to see what's going on there. And then this one is, I have the, I like some herbs that, that 
are very good for the pollinators. Greek oregano attracts many pollinators. This is, it's, it's and it's a great ground cover, you know, covers, the, you know, keeps the weeds down because it spreads. And this, um, 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 the ad red amro, yes, the amro, was very happy. Go on. Okay, let's go on to this. And the red admiral, it's more towards the fall because the asters were out. And this was, uh, about, see, once in a while, the hackberry emperor, and they, um, now these trees must be in my woods. And the, lar the larval winter in the curled up leaves. So that they're, they're in their caterpillar stage in the leaves of these trees. And they mostly, they, they like things like, um, not so much interested in flowers, but the salt and from our body, the sweat, they get on us, they'll, they're, they're going for our sweat, the, the sap, um, the animal droppings, you know, those the rotting fruit. So interesting. And that's the underside through my, it was on my screen. And then a cousin to that was the Tawny Emperor. My sister-in-law found this, same trees, same situation of hanging out in the winter. And this was on her compost bin. It was just posing perfectly. So very exciting. Hope they, they can both come back. And the final one here is my pearl crescent. There's very, very little, and he he's, looks a lot like that small um, um, meadow fritillary. And another one's just, but the, the plant is asters. So uh, asters are a wonderful plant to get in the, to have for your fall, you know, they're, they're blooming. And they also are the host plant for the pearl crescent. And they winter as a caterpillar at the base of our asters. So we don't wanna be chopping all that up. So there's um, a couple pictures of it. it. Likes my compost too. And there's the underside. And now what I'm gonna do is you will be getting this list that gets posted. Um, I'm just gonna kind of glide through our, um, a lot of pictures of nectar plants. And they, all of these are beneficial to all the butterflies, to all kinds of insects, to birds, <laughs> to um, all the pollinators we, we, we can um, think about. And here's a little tour of what my gardens looked like most recently. So I've got quite a buffet for whatever they want. And this is like, like middle of July is just peak. And I get all these good things and then they start to fade, but a lot of them go into the, the, the fall. Oh, here, just let that zoom a second. So I have lots of flutter, flutter, flutter friends. All right. So of course in the spring, I think dandelions are good. Those bees need something right away. Uh, red bud, uh, um, Eastern red buds are very great. Um, this is my uh, saladine poppies. I've been just going around and finding what's blooming. And I, the viburnums are a great plant that are uh, blooming. And a lot of our, our early pollinators are, are sustaining themselves on all these blooming trees that are happening as well as our shrubs. So, because a lot of flowers aren't available. Um, this is a Brunera. I had made a mistake in my handout. I, I thought it was native, but it's not. So I've corrected that and I'll make sure Chuck has the corrected one. I, I was I thought it was, but it's not. But but it's a, a, a nice little um, uh, early bloom. And the service berry. And these are Virginia bluebells. And this was a, 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 an early phlox. It's a short one. I, I really like it. I was in my woods and I I, I learned about this new um, azure bluet plant. And Father Jilla is a great shrub. I've been seeing all kinds of bee and insect activity all over it out my front window. And then there was an, an Easter black swallowtail joining it. The, yes, the other day, I'm like, great, nice party. The uh, Baptisias, we, I have a yellow and I have the blue, false blue indigos. Oops. There's that nine bark in bloom, bloom you know, early here in the spring. Um, our great blue lobelia and our cardinal flower are great plants. Bee bombs of all kinds are wonderful. I have like four different colors. 
there's the, the purples, one of my shades of purple, and that's Joe Pie up here. Uh, my prickly pear cactus. Uh, oh, this is this is fun. Uh, the, uh, one of the most uh, wonderful pollinator plants. In fact, I think it was rated number one in Penn State for a while. Uh, it's mountain mint. And look at the activity we can get here. All kinds of all sizes and flies and just everything. Bees and and three or four different kinds of butterflies are there. That's a definite one you want to get. That's our pearl crescent there. All right, let us move on. And the echinaceas are wonderful. Um, uh, Joe pie is one of the, and then here's our, the, the milkweeds I was talking about, the butterfly weed, the orange, and there's the swamp milkweed. And here we have clethora and ironweed. And the more there's our um, mountain mint and echinacea together. And some friend is here, and I'm sure there's this one's a buzz. Uh, black eyed Susans and brown eyed Susans. And uh, uh, this is uh, lupins are right here. And these is the cat mint that is an herb. It, it just to me, it, it's always active and it, it blooms almost all the whole. All, all season well once it starts in the summer through the fall and um, I have a we have a bat box so we're attracting you know a safe place for our bats and it's there are pollinators as well and this oh this is that Greek oregano I was mentioning and then I have the uh, common sage is another one that attracts um, some more all kind of phloxes that poor guy's really beat, uh, it's a girl beat up, but still going. And sunflowers are wonderful. This was a local field not far from my house a few years ago. And then I decided I need to be outstanding in my field. <laughs> and then uh, there's some more. And the Cthonia, the Mexican sunflower. And I save the seeds, uh, yarrows. Um, a lavender, oh my gosh, bees. I have several plants along my one side of my house. And I'll go out and it's just the whole the whole area is just buzzing. So that's a very uh, a magnet. Uh, and I, th I think zinnias, they're an annual, they, they attract all, everybody too. There's like three or four different kinds of butterflies, I think, on here all in that one shot. And I'm um, and uh, I, I like to grow okra. It's an annual vegetable, and I think the flower is neat. And I'm going to watch more to see what's attracting, what if it's attracting things. Um, another annual cosmos. Um, there, nice little landing pad for them. <laughs> That's for good for bees too. And uh, nasturtiums is a, an annual, and it's also the host for that cabbage white butterfly. You see those little white ones going around, as well as like kale and your cabbages and stuff. They all are, are host plants for that cabbage white. And uh, um, Cleome spider plant. Uh, here's some other uh, native perennials, obedient plant, at, uh, Hyssop agastache. Uh, hibiscus is a, a attracts a lot of uh, pollinators and uh, blue mist ageratum. And this is my whoops, I'm sorry. This is my garden shed. Uh, it was my old car. We gutted it, and it's my shed. And here we have kale, and I have uh, the um, sedum autumn joy. Actually, these mar marigolds came up by themselves, and I was fascinated how many butterflies and pollinators were interested. They're not my favorite, but I thought, okay, there's some of the Mexican sunflower. This is all uh, um, Tixied uh, Coreopsis. Got some coneflowers, some more uh, bee balm. And so it, it's a kind of a, a, a variety. And there, there, see, there was the butterfly on this marigold. I'm like, oh, so I hadn't noticed that before. <laughs> so I said, okay. And of course, we need our golden rods are wonderful in the spring or the fall, excuse me. And our uh, verbena is another, that's what it looks like up close, another nice um, pollinator attractor. And this is this is fun. I love this. It's, I accidentally found this herb, African blue basil. 
and I'm going to make it make it move. It 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 starts as this little tiny plant, and you grow it, and it gets huge. And in this fall, just before frost, I watch for frost. I go out and I cut a bunch of really nice cuttings, like some of the newer ones. I bring them in, put them in a glass of water on my windowsill. And they root, it's fantastic. And I let, them, I, I let them root for a really long time. And then I pot them. This is in the fall. So in the, I have these pots and then I pot them and I keep them in, so they get the Southern, well, they can get any kind of sun. And I keep them all winter. And then I'm constantly pruning them and then making more. The other day I just I did this presentation and I gave everybody, there was 35 people, I gave them one of these plants. It's just a neat uh, plant that keeps on giving and all kind of um, all kind of pollinators love it. And there's there's a picture of it. Just it's it gets huge, but it's it's happy, <laughs> easy to grow. And then coming down the stretch here, this is Agastache. This is another um, um, a bone set as a native plant. Uh, there's my bat box up in the corner. And let's see. Um, uh, this is ironweed, and that's our spice bush with that pastels. And uh, so asters, those these are the fall fall things. These we need those, and the, even the the autumn joy is a um a, in the fall. And the, this as list of nectar plants is endless, and I'm sure you have many varieties that I don't. And maybe uh, you know some you'll be able to do some seed sharing uh, with your friends and stuff in the fall. And um, in kind of closing, I wanted to show you another pollinator. So this is on my property in June. Here, let me see if I can get my, my lightning bugs and fireflies to twinkle for you. And so they're doing their own thing too, in their own way of, of being pollinators, as well as our bats. So there's a lot of things you can, uh, you know, there's so many things and there's all kinds of uh, resources you can reach out to. Another one is a good resource is Doug Talame's book. Very, very good. And I'm going to send some other resources to Chuck. So having said that, let me move on. Um, thank you for having me to share my story. And uh, here's the, some resources. You can take a picture of that, too. These are uh, wonderful books. They've won different children's uh, award book awards, but they're fantastic because they, they taught me a lot of things. They're just really good resources. And I'm going to we hope we got the picture. And then uh, that's also going to be in your handout. Um, and if you wanted to become a master gardener, you contact, you know, your local extension office and look into getting some training classes. And I say welcome or uh, please enjoy watching butterflies and pollinators and I mean, see who comes to what in your yard so you can share it, too. And there's just a wide variety of, of perennials, natives, annuals, herbs, different things to track and just have fun with it as I do. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. All right. Jane, I learned so much. <laughs> Good. Yay. Jane, you're a wonderful photographer and must have the patience of Job. <laughs> well, I think what I have is I just am alert to it. I, I'm always looking because my, my sister-in-law says, oh, I, I, I said, I just, I'm, I'm curious. I'm a curious person and I look. <laughs> so well, I love on behalf of Maria, I want to thank you very, very much. And we have a bunch of questions. <laughs> I hope I can so, answer them. If I can't, I'll get the answers and get them to you. All right. So the first one is everyone should be aware that we posted the link for our YouTube channel. Uh -huh. I, think, I think Tom Kirshner said we have like 36 of these presentations available for mm -hmm. uh, viewing on demand. Mm -hmm. So I encourage people to take advantage of that. And then if we can get to our first question, it's basically saying, um, uh, hold on. What was the plant that you found a multitude of monarchs on? Oh, I believe that was an aster because that was in the spring or, or the fall. Excuse me, I get my season in the fall. Those asters are really hot because they that's what they want. They need whatever they can get, and that's good. So asters, and that was probably okay. a new. That was probably a New England aster. Yes, that's a very good native plant, New England aster. 
Okay. Joe, you want to get the next one? Sure. Has climate change affected the nature web? Wow. <laughs> Just my opinion, I think, I don't know what's going on. So I can't really, I'm not an expert on that, but I'm just wondering, you know, I, I always think, well, why don't I have these this year? What's going on? So I don't have a clear answer on that, but we're all watching to see what's happening, aren't we? Can people go to obtain native pollinator plants? Where can they go? Well, you live in a different area than I, I think maybe, uh, maybe somebody in your group could look up some of your local uh, places that are really focusing on native plants uh, in that area. And um, I know some of our friends just went down to Bowman Hill Farms or something down your way the other day, and um, they had some plants. So I would say you're going to need to re- I think that's near Oli, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it's kind of. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly. I didn't get to go along, but yeah. But I mean, there's, I'm sure you have many native plant uh, places that you want to maybe gather a, a, a list of resources for your for your um, group, because um, I don't know down their way. We have lots of them up, up here. And where do you get your cages? Oh, oh those, you get those online. You just Google uh, butterfly habitats and pretty easy. There's different sizes. <laughs> So Robert Hare uh, posted a um, website here, shop.broodheadwatershed.org. Robert, I'm not sure, is that for butterflies or for native plants or? For uh, local or native plants, including pollinator plants. Great. Great. Good. Great. So we can put that link on the on our website as well. well that 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 is um it's the Broadhead Watershed Association, Broadheadsville. No, Broadhead Watershed Association. It's up in the Strasburg area. Uh, and this is just an annual sale that they have. This is not a continuous thing. But it's going on right now. It's an online sale. So if anybody wants to take advantage of it, you could do that and you'd have to come up here to pick it up. Right. Oh, that's great. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. You can also you can also check with like your your master gardeners locally to ask them what if they have a list. You could also check with you. I mean, we have like Manada Conservancy. If there's any concern, you know, just sort of do some outreach. Uh, ask the Audubon. You know, ask different groups that might uh, be able to give you local stuff for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do do nectar plants produce nectar continuously or just a finite amount? Yike. I don't know the answer to that. So that's <laughs> we'll have to look into that with some of the other. Yeah, I'm not sure. I really don't have the answer for that. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna put a note though to ask some of my friends who are more. Uh, yeah. How much nectar? Yeah. And and then um, Judy has a couple of comments related to some of your statements. One is Cleomi is Cleome? not is not native to the United States at least. That's oh, what she said. Did I say it was native? And if she's correcting me, I appreciate that. Um, where is she? <laughs> oh, hello? Yes. So she said, she, um, did I make a mistake? Is that what she's saying? Cleomi is not native? I can't, I, we can't hear her. It, it's okay. okay. Okay, Let's, so look. what I'm saying is if, you, if you're interested in Cleome, the spider plant, look it up and verify what, what I said. I, I could have made a mistake as far as whether it's native or not. So please uh, make a note to look that one up for yourself, okay? So, so Jane, uh, maybe a clarification. I think um, not everything in your garden is native and you were not saying that, right? Right, right. exactly, it's yeah. not. I have a variety of some, a lot of natives. And yeah, thank you very much. That's the question, yes. So, <laughs> Native in the United States, but it's native to South America, not North America. Okay. I have to look at my slide again. Did I say it was native? If I did, I apologize. And I want to everybody. <laughs> you okay. did. Hey, you know, we're all. We're all perfect. We're, none of us are perfect. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. So I'll, make, I'll make a note on my list too before I send that to you as well, um, uh, Chuck. So we have comments here about fantastic presentation, lovely photos, very informative. Um, Thank you. 
all the pictures and presentation was awesome. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Great. So, there's some more questions as we go through these. Thank yous. <laughs> There's 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 at least twenty thank yous here. Yes, there's, there's more. I had a comment. More like just... thirty or I think there's more like thirty or forty thank yous, Jane. Oh. Edge Edge of the Woods for plants as well as Eagle Point are two more um, sources for native plants. Good. And then there's and... some other um, Arcadia natives. Kelly Stoop is the best. Whatever that means, I don't know. There was a question, Chuck, if Karen, I can enter, if I can, oops, I'm sorry. Karen, can you comment on Kelly Stoop? Stoop? Is she there? Yes, Kelly Strope, I spelled it wrong, S-T-R-O-P-E, is the owner of Arcadia Natives near Washington, Pennsylvania. And this is her third season, and people travel from Erie and Philadelphia and Harrisburg to see her native plants. She's Great. just excellent. She's a perfectionist. Detail-oriented. Check out her website, arcadianatives.com. Thank you, Karen. Joe, yeah. did you find a question in all these thank yous? Yeah, I did. <laughs> I did, actually. Um, your garden is gorgeous. How do you control your weeds? Well, I think I plant I plant a lot. I just let the plants do their thing, and it, it does help. I, I, I have a, a, quite a collection of weeds that are annoying, but the, the planting it close and letting it do its thing uh, helps a lot. But the edges get a little crazy. <laughs> yeah, there's a comment that most master gardeners, and maybe someone suggested this already, that most master gardeners groups do have spring sales. Yes, yes. Ours locally do, yes. And someone mentions Glicks with a G. Greenhouse near Oli has many plants that are native, as well as other plants, species, and varieties. And Dave, Dave is asking, he lives in the Harrisburg area near you, Jane. He wants to know where your native plant stores are. What, oh. what would be a good choice around Harrisburg? Okay, well, there's a couple of things coming up. The, the Manitou Conservancy is have, it has sales often. You can Google them. Uh, Diacon Wilderness is near Boiling Springs, and that's coming up May 6th. I'll be there to help. Um, various Master Gardener sales. And oh, in New Bloomfield, Pennsylvania, there's one called Perennial Gardens. So th those are the first ones that come off my head, uh, Dave. Was it Dave, I think? David, yes. And, and Susan Struthers also put a link to a list of native plant sellers in the chat. Uh, it looks like mountcubacenter.org. Yes. So thank you for that. Lots of great resources. <laughs> I found a, just a personal comment from me. I just thought it was kind of sad to reflect on the fact that as I was growing up, goldenrod, dandelions, they were considered the, you know, great evils and, and uh, hay fever, hay fever and, and all that stuff. But uh, it was, thanks for pointing out their importance as it relates to uh, butterflies and the environment. Right. I think they say now more um, goldenrod isn't the culprit. It's more the ragweed. That's the, the hay fever, the, the, the allergy kind of thing. Well, that but, because you need to get to your but I don't. So, so I do have a question. Do willow trees lose their leaves? I mean, we got all these caterpillar and um, crystallis on these leaves. Uh, you don't need the to leaves put them back. Put no, no, I have I think a bag. Like, oh, someone needs to mute. I have a bag on there. I just say, can you go grab your bag or anything? Someone needs to mute. Oh, there we go. Please. <laughs> Yeah, they're kind of just curled up, you know, shrivelly. From what I'm thinking on my curly willows, they just kind of, uh, kind of just curl up, and some do fall, I'm sure, but not like as many. Okay. I'll have to watch. I'm going to watch that more closely. I never really thought about it, but you're right. You're right. And maybe that's why some of mine haven't been as um, uh, some of the caterpillars aren't coming. Uh, butterflies aren't coming back. It's just maybe mine are losing more than they need to, or something. So. If the, Good question. <laughs> Gives me something else to investigate. Yeah, there's another question here. You mentioned sugar trees. 
I believe that's, is it sugar maple or is it something else? What was that? Something sugar, I don't know which one they were. Um, I, I gotta get, Can I, I say? Uh, sugar tree is a type of hackberry. So it's it's sugar, it's sugar, of hackberries. Yeah, it's sugar, it was hackberries and sugarberry trees. And I must have them in my woods uh, because I don't have them in my yard, but I get some of the like that host yes the range of the, of the sugar sometimes they call it the sugar sugarberry yeah uh, it's got a more southern range it may reach into pennsylvania in some places right here in yeah. berks county we have a dwarf hackberry and we have uh they call it common hackberry which is a big tree right it's dwarf is a dwarf tree yeah i don't know where they are but they getting the two butterflies that like that host them uh but so i have something up there but i don't know what it is so that, i can't speak oh, to that there's there's six species of butterflies that use hackberries as mm -hmm. host plants and that's just in berks county right well i've got i've seen the tawny emperor and the hackberry emperor and they they're on the list so i'm i'm happy that they're coming i don't know where the tree is thank you yes. Are there any mm -hmm. other questions? Anybody want to unmute and ask a question? Oh, here's another something. Thank you, Carl. That was good information. Acadia another... natives teaches salt landings are important. Many native plants are planted under trees to provide soft landing along with leaf layers for many of these caterpillars. Mm -hmm. Ah, so Karen's answering my question as to if the leaves fall, what happens? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Karen. Mm -hmm. So they're just kind of hanging down there. Thank you, Karen, because I didn't know that either. <laughs> yeah, it's like a um, little cozy. It's like place. a cushion. It's like a mattress. They fall on a mattress. So therefore, be careful not to rake up all those leaves and all that, because you're, you know, let let it all go for the winter, you know, because uh, wow, yeah, wow. We, some people have to have everything immaculate in the in the fall, but you you don't know what you're. <laughs> What you're taking away. Thank you, Karen. Very good information. Yeah, there's another comment about uh, that the USDA plant database tells you if a plant is native down to the county level. Oh, yeah. um, Ernst Seeds does not have plants, but has seed that are PA echo type. Hmm. That's neat to find out exactly where they're native to. What was the name of that website? It was the USDA Plant Database. Okay, yes, okay. Thank you. Whoever offered that boy, this nice exchange of information. Yes, and here's somebody has them about uh, Heather Holmes and uh, Doug Tellamy. Those are both really great um, uh, presenters and stuff. And I, yeah. We actually had Doug on two, three years ago now, Joe? Yeah. Yeah, now he's the he's the pro. <laughs> I'm the observer. <laughs> well, it, it, it's it's very very um, very well received, um, Jane. Thank you very yeah. much. I'm glad. I'm you glad have a lot of interest and a lot of cross fertilization here. No, no pun intended. <laughs> Good. Well, are there any other questions? I just thank you very much. That was that was wonderful. Thank you. I appreciate your feedback and everything. And I've learned some things. I have a couple of corrections to make. I appreciate pointing out some, sometimes the, my errors. <laughs> I appreciate that. And uh, looks like I had a, one time it was about 115 people or so on there. So yes, I, 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 did. I, you I had record. 115. And until a few minutes ago, you had 80 staying for the Q&A for 20 minutes. So That's you obviously... Uh, enthralled the audience and met our exceeded our expectations. Right. So, so nice thank to... you, thank you so much for uh, joining us and sharing your your wonderful story. Um, and uh, I know so much more about butterflies now. Well, good. I, I have a whole different level of respect for butterflies. Right, and it all carries over to all the other pollinators. They all kind of work together, and they're all enjoying it and cohabitating. <laughs> So enjoy, everybody. Have a great uh, summer and great gardening and observe, observe, observe. Thanks, Jane. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very Jane. much. Okay. Bye-bye.